Brothers and sisters, welcome today. My name is Sean Madsen. I'm the first counselor in the sixth ward, and Bishop Souther wasn't able to be here, and he asked me, to, asked me to conduct these meetings, and I feel a privilege and an honor to be here and to celebrate the life of uh, Brother Charles Rigby. Um, the uh, family prayer was just um, performed or said by brother or my son, Robert Rigby, his son. Our prelude and postlude music today will be by Sister Sandy Williamson from the Sixth Ward. And our chorister is um, Carrie Thompson, the granddaughter. Our opening hymn will be hymn number 293, Each Life That Touches Ours for Good. And the invocation will be by Brother Todd Anderson, son of law.
Thank you, Todd. Um, the program will go as follows. We'll have a live sketch from Greg Andrews, son of mom. And then we'll have um, Christ-like attributes um, from each of the daughters, Sherry, Guyan, Jennifer Nelson, Mary Kay Boyd, Becky Anderson, Tricia Wilkes, Allie Tomlinson, Julie Andrew, Nancy the Sword. Am I close? Okay. And um, I think that'll be it. Then we'll have a musical member, or I will follow the, and that'll be by um, daughters Catherine. Um, Catherine, granddaughter. Okay. And then we'll hear from a brother, um, son in law, Cheryl Tomlinson, and Dave Lasore. And then I'll have some closing remarks. So we'll go ahead and turn some time over to Todd. Oh, no, to Greg. Charles Emery Rigby was born on February 21st, 1921 in Sugar City, Idaho, to David Eckersley Rigby and Agnes Elsie Price. He was the youngest of nine children. When he was two years old, his family moved to Chance, Montana, where his father farmed. His dad passed away when Charles was eight years old, and his older brothers took over the farming duties. Charles had a great childhood with seven brothers and one sister. He had one older brother who would pay Charles a nickel to scratch his back, and Charles thought he was rich. He would milk cows before he went to school in the morning, and after school he had lots of chores as well, and he had to milk the cows again. Although he, uh, these were the years of the Great Depression, he said he never wanted for anything because his family raised all of their own food. Family eventually lost the farm when Charles was 11 years old. So his family moved to Driggs, Idaho, and lived with his maternal grandmother. His mother worked in her brother's store before she remarried to T. Ross Wilson. This resulted in Charles gaining many new step siblings with the Wilson family and forming relationships he cherished throughout the years. While attending Utah State University, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps Reserves. And after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Harbor, he was called into active duty. He trained to become a pilot and flew a B-17 bomber. He achieved the rank of captain. He was stationed in Foggia, Italy, and he successfully completed 35 precarious bombing missions. He was awarded the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross by returning his crew safely in their severely damaged plane. After the war ended, he attended the University of Southern California Dental School on the GI Bill. He met Mary Jane Tolton in California, and upon his graduation from dental school, they were married in the Idaho Falls Temple on July 7, 1949. <coughs> He practiced dentistry in Idaho Falls for 44 years. They were blessed with nine children, eight daughters, and one son. Charles served actively in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, holding many callings, including serving on the High, High Council and as bishop for eight years. He also served on the local school board. Once he retired, Charles and his wife, Mary Jane, served as ordinance workers in the Idaho Falls Temple. In 1989, he and his wife enjoyed serving a mission in the California Santa Rosa Mission. In 1992, Charles and Mary Jane moved to Linden, Utah to be closer to family. They worked as temple workers in both the Provo and Mount Timpanogos temples. Charles lovingly cared for Mary Jane when she suffered from Alzheimer's disease. When she was eventually moved into a care center, Charles would visit her every day with one of his daughters. She passed away on February 28, 2007. Charles continued to serve in the temple until he was 94 years of age. Since his wife's death, he has lived with his daughter and son-in-law, Allie and Cheryl Tomlinson, who have taken great care of him. 
Dolly was able to accompany Charles on the honor flight to Washington, D.C. after he ended his service at the temple. He loved to walk and go through a regimen of exercises every day and eat a big green salad for lunch. He contracted the COVID-19 virus last year in January and survived that. He passed away peacefully in his sleep on March 6th, 2022. Charles was an amazing, loving example of service to his family, extended family, and many around him. We will cherish the great influence he has been in all of our lives. At the beginning of his mortal ministry, Jesus Christ walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and called out to two fishermen, Peter and Andrew, and said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The Savior calls each of us to follow him. Throughout his life, Dad has been a great example of striving to follow the Savior. We want to share what his actions have helped to teach us about developing important Christ-like attributes. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak about the attribute of faith because I feel my father exemplified this trait greatly throughout his life. The Bible Dictionary explains that faith is to hope for things which are not seen but which are true. We see this stated in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We learn that faith must be centered in Jesus Christ. How do we get faith? Faith is kindled by hearing the testimony of those who have faith. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 states, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing is by the word of God. My father had great faith. He had a testimony of the gospel. And both my mother and father have helped me to have great faith and to have a great and strong testimony of Jesus Christ. We learn that faith is a principle of action and of power. My father put the principle of faith into his everyday actions and lifelong pursuits, and I hope I can put the principle of faith into my life and uh, my actions and that I may influence others to gain faith and act upon their faith. I am grateful for the principle of faith, for the example of my parents, for my testimony of Jesus Christ, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. not very often I get to be at the top of the list. <laughs> My attribute I'm speaking on is hope. Hope is an abiding trust that the Lord will fulfill his promises to you. It is manifest in confidence, optimism, enthusiasm, and patient perseverance. It is believing and expecting that something will occur. When you have hope, you work through trials and difficulties with the confidence and assurance that all things will work together for your good. Hope helps you conquer discouragement. The scriptures often describe hope in Jesus Christ as the assurance that you will inherit eternal life in the celestial kingdom. My father was a great example of this attribute of Christ. He taught by example that working hard and persevering would help you get through the trials in your life. He was also a great example of someone that loved 
the temple. As a young child, I remember my parents faithfully attending the temple regularly. As we children grew and started moving away, he and my mother were able to serve as temple ordinance workers. They loved serving in the temple. My dad was able to serve in the temple until the age of 94. I know that part of that was made possible by the many, many temple workers that kept my and my dad at the temple. He always had someone that would offer him a ride home so that he wouldn't have to burden his children. Believe me, it was never a burden. And we as a family appreciate all those that helped him live his life to the fullest. He was able to continue attending the temple until just a few months ago. He also continued to study the gospel regularly until the end. President James E. Faust taught, hope is the anchor of our souls. Hope is trust in God's promises. Faith that if we act now, the desired blessings will be fulfilled in the future. Thank you, Dad, for being a wonderful father, husband, grandfather, uncle, and friend. For teaching correct, for teaching correct principles by living your life every day centered on the Savior. Thank you for the games we watch together and the advice you would give me in quiet ways. Thank you for teaching me that I am the daughter of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I loved my dad so much. And I get to speak on charity and love in Moroni 747. It says, but charity is the pure love of Christ and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. When I was a young adult, I made a really disappointing mistake. And I was so sad to disappoint my dad, but I went to talk to him and he taught me the greatest life lesson that I ever learned and he didn't ask me any details, he didn't ask me any questions, he just said, Mary Kay, you know, we love you and it's not what you've done in the past that matters, it's how you feel about it and how you're going to move forward in the future and the things you do in the future. And he did that with tenderness and with tears, and it taught me at that time the power of charity, the power of atonement, forgiveness, and I have, it has been the greatest learning experience in my life. I was born of goodly parents, and the longer I live, I find out what a great blessing that is. Both my mother and dad were examples of enduring to the end of faith and service of service. We used to watch them serve all the time. And um, they taught me so much through their actions. And I've had the honor this, this past couple of years of being able to serve my father, to see him most days, to help him. And I consider that an honor that I was able to spend that time with him and get to know him. And I never left without him saying, Mary Kay, I appreciate what you do and I love you. And I loved him and I want to tell Allie and Cheryl how much I appreciate them. I'm grateful for my Savior and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christ-like attribute that I want to share is virtue. By definition, virtue is moral excellence, conformity of one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles, and the quality of doing what is right and avoiding what is wrong. 
My dad was a great example of someone who believed in and practiced moral excellence. He had a strong testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the importance of keeping the commandments. He was who he was in every situation, in his business dealings, in his service to others, and in his dealings within our family. He kept his word and lived by his principles with no hypocrisy or guile. He believed in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Rather than teaching through sermons, he taught us through the example how to be a virtuous person. My dad had a strong sense of duty. His family was his most important duty, and he worked to provide for us and to give us opportunities to do the things that we wanted to do. Education was important to him and he wanted to provide the opportunity for all of his children to receive a college education. He also made it possible for those of us who wanted to to serve full-time missions. <clears throat> One of the greatest examples, as was mentioned in his eulogy, was he set for us was when he um, lovingly took care of our mother in her later years as she suffered from Alzheimer's. He cared for her at home for as long as he was able to, and then after she went into the care center, he went to see her every single day. He loved to serve and was an ordinance worker in the temple and found so much enjoyment in having the opportunity to attend the temple several days a week. Dad loved life and he loved, he had a positive attitude and he was happy every single day. He found things in his everyday life to appreciate and to be thankful for. I loved to visit him because he always was so appreciative of anything that I did for him. Every visit, every call, he expressed gratitude for, as Mary Kay mentioned. I always left my visits with him feeling uplifted, knowing that he loved me and my family, and knowing that he was proud of me. I am so grateful to have such wonderful dad. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> The attribute that I would like to talk about is patience. My dad was full of patience. In a house full of children and all the chaos that goes along with that, it was amazing to see the amount of patience that my dad had. He was a man that was very slow to anger. I honestly don't ever remember him raising his voice. He loved to fish and he would take his daughters fishing with him. Now, would he actually get to fish himself? No. He would go from fishing pole to fishing pole, making sure that each one of us had bait on our hooks. And then we would ask him to cast for us. And if a fish actually was on one of our lines, we would start screaming and ask Dad to reel it in. And we never wanted to actually touch the fish. <laughs> But when we returned home, we would always tell our mom how much fun it was to go fishing. He was raised in a family that was all boys, except for one sister. He patiently waited through the birth of four daughters before his son was born. And then his patience was tried again through the birth of four more daughters. In Mosiah 24, verse 15, it says, they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. Getting old is not for the faint of heart. My dad endured to the end. But he did not just endure life's, life and its difficulties. He endured it well. And with patience has, deal with, has dealt with his diabetes, his macular degeneration, and the decline of his hearing. He never complained about things but was always optimistic about life and was so grateful for all of his blessings. It was a joy to go and visit my dad because he would always lift me up with his great attitude and zeal for life. I will miss my visits with him and I will cherish the last father's blessing I received from him this past summer after he turned the age of 100. I couldn't have asked for a better dad. And I'm so grateful for his example in my life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. amen.
Humility is being willing to submit to the will of the Lord and to give Him the honor for accomplishment. Humility includes gratitude for His blessings and recognizing our need for His divine help. Dad taught us the importance of seeking for divine help. I love to hear him pray. His prayers were earnest and sincere. He spoke with love to his Heavenly Father, asking him for the help in doing his will. I also watched Dad spending time every day reading and pondering the scriptures. He knew that in them, he would find the Lord's guidance and direction for him. The, state, the Savior spoke about the importance of humility in Matthew when he said, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Dad was a true servant to others throughout his life in many ways. Many of us children were able to work with him in his dental practice, and often patients would make comments to me like, Your dad is so kind and caring and conscientious. And at my young age, comments like that had a big impression on me, and I wanted to follow his example. Dad had the gift of gratitude, as has been mentioned. We've had the great blessing of having him in our home with us these past years, and I don't think there was a day or very few days that went by that he didn't say, thank you so much for all you do for me. He would express that day after day, not only to me, but to those who called or visited or ministered to him. I want to follow his example of being filled with gratitude because I saw how happy it made him. I'm grateful for a father who loved me unconditionally. He let us know that his joy and his purpose was in his family. And as one of his children, that is very powerful. I love my dad, I want to express that to him and know that my life has been eternally blessed by him. And I express these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The attribute of Christ that I'm focusing on is diligence. Diligence is steady, consistent, earnest, and energetic effort. Diligence in living the gospel is an expression of our love for Jesus Christ as we follow his teachings. In Doctrine and Covenants 5827, we read, Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause, and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. This is how my father lived his life. He showed us, through his actions, the things that were of most importance to him, Jesus Christ, his family, and service. My dad taught me so many lessons. One was his constant efforts to strengthen his knowledge and testimony of Jesus Christ. His ministering brother, Victor Walsh, would enlarge um, and copy the Come Follow Me lessons each week and drop it off to my dad so that my dad could read it with his failing eyesight. Dad told me once, I don't have any excuses for not being able to study the gospel. He faithfully read the lessons and the scriptures each week. My dad was also diligent about his exercise. Many of you saw him walk the streets of Linden each day for years. Then he would come home inside and exercise his shoulders with a pulley system that he had made. Um, and um, he would do that, I watched him do that until he sweat. He was also diligent in his, his garden, every summer growing tomatoes, zucchini, and radishes for his lunch salads. If you ever shook his hand, he had a strong grip for a man of his age. He and his brother Rex each milk 12 to 15 cows every morning and night on the farm. Another lesson my dad taught me was the importance of relationships. He set personal goals to call all his nieces and nephews. He was a quiet man, but fed
felt deeply and cared about everyone, no matter who you were. I called my father every Sunday. What a joy those calls were. He would tell me about adventures with Joel. We, he said, we bagged apples this week. I helped Cheryl bag the apples, or we took a trip. He took me down to southern Utah. My dad made, my dad enjoyed every adventure he had with Cheryl. He also made me feel important. He would always want to know about my children. He would also tell me about um, his calls with Robert and what my sisters were doing. When I asked how he was feeling, he would say, I feel better than a man my age ought to. He was always so positive. I have a testimony of Jesus Christ because of a loving Heavenly Father and my loving Earthly Father. Dad, I love you so much. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We have been studying the Old Testament this year in Come, Follow Me, and we remember that Adam and Eve were commanded to offer sacrifices unto the Lord. And in Psalms, the Lord declared that he really had no need to demand animal sacrifices from his people. And why? Because all creatures are already his. But what then does God want from each of us? He answers by telling the people in Proverbs 40, 50, 14, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. We must have a sense of thankfulness for what God has done and does do for us, and secondly, a determination to preserve a relationship with Him by keeping His covenants. That brings us to the attribute of obedience. Obedience is the first law of heaven. It is an act of faith, as we read and preach my gospel. And the Lord declared through Jeremiah that I, I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it, is, it may be well unto you. My dad was a great example of being obedient to our Heavenly Father. He kept the covenants that he made in the temple. Because he was willing to be obedient, he increased in faith, knowledge, and wisdom. His testimony was strengthened, and he was protected throughout his life. Because of the many wise decisions that he made, he was able to live a life of service to others. He blessed the lives of many as a bishop, and he blessed the lives of many as a dentist. I was always grateful to be able to go to my dad for counsel and for good advice, and I knew that I could count on his obedience to the principles of the gospel. I have tried to be obedient to my covenants as well, and I'm so grateful for a mother and father who bless their children by the obedience that they show to our Heavenly Father. And I'm grateful for, for them, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
truly honored to be able to speak today. And the angel daughters have taken my whole talk. I apologize, I'm going to stay close to what I prepared, or I, I would be too easy to deviate on talking about Charles. I'll go ahead. Charles came to live with us approximately 17 years ago when our son Brandon was two years old and Chase was almost four and a half. My brother called me and said, you need another dog for your boys. He brought us up a pure Cocker Spaniel. The boys and Cindy fell in love with him and Cindy gave him special attention. Jason Brandon immediately named him Rocket. Okay, so why do I bring this up? Well, it's because Rocket and Grandpa passed away on the same day, Sunday, the 6th of March. Grandpa at 2.45. And Rocket around 11 p.m. Rocket was always looking into Grandma's window, especially breakfast time, lunch time, and dinner. I found Rocket laying, he had passed away in front of Grandpa's window. May I say, as Jacob said in the Book of Mormon, Jacob 7:26. Our lives will pass as if were unto us a dream. And having Charles live in our home was as if a wonderful, pleasant spiritual dream. I could speak for hours on the many wonderful experiences we had with Grandpa over the past 17 years. Montana. Grand Canyon, Zion, St. George, Monticello Temple, fishing, snowmobiling into the cabin, the garden, helping with the apple harvest, and long drives. But really, the most important special time with him was serving in the temple. The greatest knowledge I've ever gained is from watching him and trying to follow his example. To me, this sums up Grandpa's life. Temples have been on the earth since the beginning of time. The, the scriptures speak of Moses' temple in Exodus, Solomon's temple in 2 Chronicles, Herod's temple found in Matthew. Nephi's, Nephi temples, 2 Nephi, Mosiah, and 3rd Nephi. All throughout the Bible, the Book of Mormon, all these temples were lost because of apostasy. Been restored in our day because of the restoration of the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith. Now we have over 200 temples throughout the earth, making each area a little bit of Zion where God dwells. This, this really makes me think of Charles. In Exodus, we learn Aaron brought his sons to the temple of their day, which was called the Tabernacle, and received ordinances and blessings that would guide them throughout their lives. In essence, Charles and Mary Jane have guided their children to the temple to allow them to have these same incredible blessings to help them throughout their lives and into eternity. As I think of Grandpa, life, he was smart, extremely intelligent. He was a dentist. It's not an easy accomplishment to do, especially back in his uh, generation. He followed the counsel of each and every prophet since he was a young boy. He always studied the scriptures each day. He knew the truth. He knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. 
he would never speak unkind to or about anyone. Surely he had no guile. He bore the trials that were placed upon him with honor. As a young boy, he lost his father. As a young man, he flew as a pilot, 35 combat mission in Europe, knowing that each mission, there was a pretty good chance he wouldn't make it back 35 times. He truly is a great American hero, uh, physically and spiritually. Also as a young man in his 40s, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Many other burdens that only he knew, which he showed by himself with the help of the Savior. He was in fantastic health for breakfast. He would always have a bowl of oatmeal with cinnamon, or I would say a bowl of cinnamon with a little bit of oatmeal. <laughs> for lunch, you would have a baked potato and chili, or as he would say, chili con carne. You would always laugh about that. Then he'd have six little slices of cheese and an extra large salad, extra large. It would take him an hour to eat it. He'd always put one apple on top that he would cut up in squares. For dinner, two fried eggs, toast, and a bowl of peaches. But most importantly, he loved his posterity. He had eight angel daughters. He had one tender-hearted son, and they all brought him unspeakable joy, just unspeakable joy. He loved his nephews and his nieces, and he always talked about and cared, cared for them. He walked every day, he did holy exercises, he did weights. He truly was not weary his 101 years. He truly lived every minute until he died. He was humble and grateful to the very end. At midnight, before he passed away, Allie and I were checking on him. And I walked up and I grabbed his hand and I said, Charles, you doing okay? And he says, yeah, I'm okay. And, I, and then he squeezed my hand and I said, well, we got the monitor set. We can hear any little noise you make. And we'll be down if you need anything. And he, then he squeezed my hand and he said, sure, well, thank you. Thank you for everything. But he, did, he did that every day. Never, never have I seen a man so I had so much gratitude for the Savior and for the Gospel and all things. I, I felt such a void. I love him dearly. I love his daughter. I love his son. And what an honor and a blessing it has been for him to be in our home. And I testify that Jesus is the Christ, Savior of the world. This is his church on the earth. I love the plan of salvation. I love the gospel. And I bear this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is remarkable to me that of all the tenets of the gospel, all the commitments and the covenants, the ordinances that clothe them with such glorious symbolic meaning. The deep doctrines that answer so many of life's most difficult questions, our missionaries declare first and foremost above everything else, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That single principle explains, motivates, and gives purpose to all else we do. From obedience to sacrifice, to each of the virtues, these Christ-like attributes that his daughter spoke of today. The sacrifice, the service we each give is motivated, is anchored in our faith in Jesus Christ. Our willingness, 
our motivation to repent and try to make course corrections in our lives <clears throat> is a function of that faith. We celebrate Christmas not because it marks the day a good man, a magnificent teacher was born, but because we have absolute faith in Easter, in His resurrection, in the atonement that was wrought, and we celebrate it <clears throat> and do our best to incorporate it into our lives. I simply want to say that in my life, I too grew up without a father until I married Nancy and learned things I could not have learned in any other way. It stuns me that a life as quiet as his could have screamed so loudly, faith and faithfulness. He was a seminar for all of us, a glorious seminar, and we all will cherish and be grateful for his influence in our lives. I humbly testify, brothers and sisters, that faith is not a gift, it's a choice. We often think that faith is the mother of faithfulness, but my experience and my silver hair has taught me that just the opposite is more often than not true. Faithfulness breeds, spawns, builds faith. And Dad's life was a tribute to that truth. No man I've known has been more faithful more consistently, diligently, beautifully, quietly, faithful than he has been. I honor him for that. And I testify of its power in each of our lives. His life was a great invitation to all who knew and loved him to follow the Master, to find the peace that is promised in faithfulness. And I pray we may all do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. It's been a wonderful meeting. I've been wondering what... Um, I've been thinking about Charles all week and wondering what I could say that would be appropriate for this occasion. Uh, I hope some of these words will be a benefit to someone here today. I, uh, Sunday evening, we were talking to uh, my son Parker, who's friends with Chase, and we told him about Brother Rigby passing away, and he was reminded of a story and has been alluded to here today about the mission that he went on when he was in the military and, and uh, the plane he was flying as it was hit by the enemy and, and um, he was able to fly that plane home and land it. And the story that Parker said, I don't know if this is exactly true, but Chase told him that um, they got, they, once they landed, they witnessed that plane that there was a hole in it big enough to drive a car through. I don't know if he exaggerated or not, that's a pretty awesome story. It tells us a little bit about the hero that he was. I've been able to be an observer these last 17 years as, as they've lived in the ward. Um, the uh, wonderful man that Brother Rigby was and is. I don't think anybody enjoyed that, which would be a hundred more than him. And it seems like he found more joy in that than he found lots of joy in being able to do that. Um, so here's my message today. When we Let me read this. 
I'll wake up and think about Charles and life well lived. How did he do that? In just, in just a minute, I want to share a few thoughts on Scripture with you. When we think of the Garden of Eden, it sounds so wonderful. Everything was provided and there was no weeds to weed. Um, no, all the animals got along, plenty of food. I'm sure the weather was great every day. In 2 Nephi, we learned a little bit more about it. Uh, Le Lehi was getting a little bit older. He brought his family together and he taught them a little bit. He said, um, in verse 23 in, chap in Nephi chapter 2, and this one thing he said about Adam and Eve, and they would have no children, wherefore they would, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, but they knew no sin. I find that interesting, no joy, seems like life is pretty great, doing no good, for they knew no sin. So in this life, we may have... We may have to have some misery to understand what true joy is. We may need to make some mistakes and repent to know what true joy is. We may need to make some changes along our journey to truly be happy. I think Mary Kay's story went along with that. I'm sure there was some true joy when she went to her, her dad and had that experience with him. I can't imagine what Charles went through during the war and the feelings and emotions he must have had. But somehow he turned that tragedy early in his life into a wonderful life. As we hear about losing his dad at such a young age, losing the farm, um, I can't imagine how difficult that would have been. Second uh, Nephi chapter 2, verse 25. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. I testify in this life that this life is a life of joy. I testify that there will always be different difficult things that each of us will deal with. Some are some out of our control and some some caused by our own choices and our own actions. That's part of this journey. I promise as we rely on the Savior we can get through these challenges and find true joy. Um, and then section or verse 28. Now my sons, I would that you should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words. And choose eternal life according to the according to his will, to the will of his spirit. Um, brothers and sisters, or men and women are that they might have joy. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn will be Where Can I Turn for Peace in number 129. And the benediction will be that they are
Our beloved Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this time that we have spent commemorating and celebrating the life of Charles Rigby. We're so thankful for his family, for his children, for those things that we have learned in this past hour about Charles' life and his influence and the attributes of our Savior Jesus Christ that he consistently demonstrated throughout his life. We're grateful for all who are here, for, for family, for his extended family, for great friends and neighbors, uh, and for those who have traveled long distances to celebrate uh, together with Charles and with his family. We appreciate all the blessings that thou has given to us and are so grateful for the gospel in our lives. And pray now for thy spirit to continue with us and to help us to incorporate into our lives the attributes that we learned from Charles and from our other brother, Jesus Christ. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Troy. Um, immediately after this, there will be uh, a luncheon provided by the Sixth Ward for all those who would like to attend here in the uh, Cultural Hall. After that luncheon, all who would like to attend the graveside service that will take place at Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park, um, where the dedication of the grave will be performed by son in law David Wilkes. Um, this time we wish we'd ask you all to stand. We'll ask the pallbearers. You want them to gather in this foyer over here? 